Hi and welcome to the third episode of the Cantaris podcast. So today we're taking a look at user-centered and accessible design and we're joined by a couple of guests from the Cantaris team. So uh, Rob and Katie, why don't you introduce yourselves? Sure. Hey everyone, my name is Rob Helsby and I'm the head of experience design at Cantaris. So I've been connecting brands and organizations with their customers since around 2010. Um, worked with brands of all shapes and sizes and I've been working with Cantaris for the past three years or so. My role basically sees me manage and oversee our user experience um, and design offerings. So we get involved in lots of exciting different projects and I get to work with fantastically talented people such as Katie who's joining us today. Right. I'm Katie. Uh, I am a UX designer here at Cantaris. I have a very long background with special education and disability awareness, which is where my passion for accessibility comes from when it comes to designing websites, is uh, to give people who don't normally have a voice a voice on online platforms. That's what I'm here to talk about today. Well, okay, so um, let, let's get started then by uh, defining the topic in the most the most general terms. So what what is accessibility? Um, who is it for and how uh, how can it benefit people both with and without disabilities? Yeah, so accessibility is ensuring that your website is usable for all people, not just people with disabilities, but it's especially important that you do it for people with disabilities as well. Um, I think a lot of people think that accessibility is only for people with disabilities, but it turns out that it's useful for other people as well. So situational accessibility, things like I've lost my glasses and I can't really see my phone very well. Uh, I've broken my hand and now I can't really use my phone and, and type as easily. Um, a mother, you know, juggling her child and trying to book a doctor's appointment, being out in the sun and not being able to see the contrast on your phone, things like that. Um, People use accessibility tools in day to day, and they don't even necessarily realize that they are, which is a, a mark of good design, really, is making sure that everything is usable and accessible for any person. Um, but most importantly, for people with cognitive or visual or hearing impairments, um, any sort of disability that could make it difficult for them to use a website on the phone or desktop. Yeah, I think that when we when we think about the physical world comparisons compared to compared to digital, it's a really, really nice way of sort of bringing it to life to people. So, for example, a um, having a a ramp enable people to get into a shop with with a, with a steep slope. Obviously, that's brilliant for people who are in a wheelchair, but it's also really useful for people who might be pushing a pram, for example. So, you know, they don't necessarily have anything um, affecting them physically, but they do have a need to have that extra lift. Um, and it also benefits everyone else because, you know, they're going to avoid that that tricky step. <laughs> or people with mobility issues as well, um, or coordination uh, is one that people don't really think about is some people are a little less coordinated with a neurological disorder. Uh, and they may, may need to go up the ramp instead of the stairs because it helps them to to get into a place. Same with having a lift is being able to get into a building that is downstairs. If there's stairs and you have a broken leg or you're not able to walk, how are you going to get into the building? So it, it is really an important thing that people may not notice or may not think about, but it is beneficial to everyone yeah it's trying mm -hmm. to le level the playing field for everyone isn't it so yeah. there's no um no one has any barriers to enjoy um yeah whatever it might be whether it's a website or an app or a or a sort of um real world experience i think barriers is the right word um because i think that they a lot of people will run into roadblocks all, all over the place uh it, it's kind of shocking how little knowledge there is out there which is why it's so important that especially when it comes to websites, um, accessibility has really started to, to take shape in the world that we live in, in technology. And um, I think it's really important to get the word out there for everyone to see that it's, it's not just, you know, something that's really irritating, a, a box to tick. It's you're creating 
barriers for people if you're not designing things accessibly and then you won't have people coming onto your site it is just the right thing to do to design for everybody and, and not block people out um but i think for a lot of reasons it's important for most <laughs> organizations who think yeah i don't really need to design this accessibly to really think about it a little bit more people who don't have extreme disabilities myself not being able to see without glasses for example you know i i blow up text on my screen quite often and i don't have that bad of eyesight <laughs> but um you know if people are designing their websites with eight point font and you're trying to see your screen from this far away it's really difficult so things like not putting text over images not using really teeny tiny text making sure that your colors are a certain contrast to its background, not putting yellow on white, for example, which is a one it's one that I see all the time. And it's it's hard for me to see, and I don't have a, a you know, color blindness or anything. Um, but you know, little little things like that are they make a huge impact. Um alt text being another one that I think a lot of people see that as just a box to tick. So they'll put in an image and it's whatever the image was named from their file. It could be queen underscore crown underscore two, five, eight, nine, you know, and that's getting read out to people who are blind as their only way of seeing it. And I think people don't really think about blind people as seeing, but they have their own pictures in their head whether or not they were able to see prior to their blindness, they're listening to all of these alt text. And if it's not great alt text, then they're not getting the full picture of your site. Yeah, I think that you know, brands and organizations obviously should um, make their platforms more greatly accessible. And that should be you know, either through, because it's an, an inclusive thing to do, because it's an empathetic to, thing to do, because it's the right thing to do. But you know, I think around, one in five people um, around the world have some form of disability. So it's a real huge amount. I think it's probably around 2 billion globally, uh, which is kind of a staggering number. So, you know, if you want to look at it in business terms, you're technically cutting off a fifth of your potential audience from enjoying your products and your services. And if you're a e-commerce platform, then obviously that's going to have a, a huge potential knock-on effect in terms of the revenue that you can drive. If you're a membership organization looking to increase um, signups and registrations again that's a huge proportion of people that you might be isolating and turning away from your um, from your offering similar to booking you know booking events booking onto training or even just enjoying your platform at all I'm sure that you know if you land on a website and you're not able to understand and consume that information you're going to get either a bit frustrated and kind of affect your affinity with that brand so it's actually going to damage your your sort of your brand affiliation or you're just going to be completely switched off and you know go to a competitor or shut down your laptop or we already go elsewhere so mm. you know i think cutting off that really significant portion of your potential audience is um you know is a real key motivation as well i think another thing to add to that um is it, it's a lot easier to gain people's trust if you design accessibly from the get-go it's really hard to say, look, I have fixed this for you. If somebody's come onto your site and thought, you know, this doesn't, this site doesn't represent me. It doesn't help people like me. This is not for people like me. They're going to leave the site. And then if you've done your research and you found that a certain amount of people are leaving because they can't see a certain color or they can't read the content, you're not going to be able to go to them and say, oh, I see the problem. Okay, here you go. I fixed it. They're going to be like, well, no, you didn't do it from the start. So mm. why should I trust you to think about people like me if you're not thinking about it from the start? So it is really, really important to think about things like that when designing your site, when writing your content, when doing outreach to, to people in the community that you're trying to create, you, you need to create that trust. Well, I had an experience last night with a website, which probably relates more to user-centered design than accessible design, but I was trying to set up some insurance um, and each page had a form on it. And there was two buttons at the bottom of each page. And one said continue and one said save and exit. And the continue button was orange and on the left-hand side, 
and the save and exit button was green and on the right hand side. So every time I got to the end of the form, I was hitting save and exit instead of continue because they'd placed oh, it yeah. where every other button I've used recently has been in the bottom right and it's been green. So I was just pressing that without reading it. And it brought me out of the form every single time and asked, are you sure you want to end and close? And so in the end, I gave up and just went to a different a different supplier. It was that frustrating to kind of use yeah. the, 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 the form. And I mean, that's an obvious example of user-centered design that, you know, having a few people uh, have a go at using that, they would have flagged that frustration, I imagine. Um, and that that's kind of the other... Uh, the other topic that we want to cover today and something that accessibility very much sits within in, in our approach to design at Cantaris, I think. But um, can we have an intro as well, Rob, to the idea of uh, user-centered design and perhaps kind of frame where accessibility fits within that picture? So I think there's there's a great deal of of crossover, as, as, as you say, Sam. I think that you know, when we talk about accessibility, we're really talking about usability as well. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of two two sides to the same coin, really. Um, I think that if you're not investing in gaining a real understanding of who those end users are that we're creating these digital experiences for, you're always going to get quite lackluster results. You're going to end up in a big shiny new website that might look great and that sort of meets some of the business needs of that closed circle of people who've commissioned it, but it's not necessarily going to be more effective. It's not necessarily going to be actually delivering tangible um, improvements for you. So really there is no limit to how much you can invest in you know, defining who your audiences are understanding what their goals what their motivations are why they might be coming to use your product to use your service to engage with your organization mm. you know understanding um how to actually create an experience that's really tailored around them so we're all about creating what we call sort of a minimum lovable product so making sure that whatever we're going to launch with has actually got real tangible use um for those end users something that actually makes people have a joyful experience so whether it's you know you gave the good example there someone you've got a poor user experience of moving through those forms you know you're going to be signing up to purchase that insurance whatever it might be so obviously a key a key metric for the insurance company that you are dealing with and you're mm -hmm. you have a single goal as well and if that's not been optimized if that's not going very well you know that's a direct example of you quickly moving away and actually taking business away from that organization because they've not actually tested that user journey they've not tested that 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 experience so it's about having as much of an understanding as you possibly can about who we're, who we're creating the platforms for testing little testing often um, and really, it's about ensuring that you're going to be eventually launching a much more successful project um, further down the line. So, yeah, it's really about getting in the mindset of the end users, investing in research, and then you know ensuring as much as you can um, a successful sort of product. Yeah, I, th I think the difference between um, MLP and kind of M MVP, which perhaps a lot of other um, a lot of other agencies may use, is. Uh, is a pretty key one because in, in a lot of senses so you know again to use that example um that was a, a minimum viable product it was possible to submit that form it was possible to buy what you were trying to buy but it wasn't very good um so i think the the, the approach of looking at well actually what's the minimum lovable product we can deliver is 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 a much better approach um because there are plenty of things you can deliver which do work and do do fulfill what they need to do but not in a way that's usable for, uh, for for everyone necessarily. Yeah, I think from a from a sort of business perspective and from a sort of engineering perspective, the term minimal viable product does does make a degree of sense. But it doesn't sound very glamorous. It doesn't sound very appealing. It doesn't mm. sound like something that I would want to be invested in. So it sounds really, like a box ticked. Exactly. We really do want to, you know, put put the put the love into it. So making sure that it's a uh, it's a joyful experience as well. So mm -hmm. one thing that we always strive for, um, particularly as a, as a design team, is to create experiences that are simple, beautiful, and effective. We want to make sure that we're, you know, when, we, when we're hitting all of all of those three notes in, in harmony, we know that we're gonna be delivering um, you know, really great outcomes. So it needs to be aesthetically pleasing, it needs to be you know, joyful to use, whether it's um, subtle animations and interactions as you're moving through something as dry as an, an insurance form, you know, that can be, that can be kind of pleasant too. Um, mm. Make sure that we're removing any sort of clutter. So, you know, trimming down the amount of content, not having any distractions, making sure that I can quickly and effectively move through my user journey. So again, you gave the great example there, Sam, of two conflicting buttons. So the 
positioning of those buttons is key, the color of those buttons is key, and also the actual labeling of those buttons is key as well. So it's about really understanding how can I get this person from A to B as quickly and as easily as possible, and how can I make that as joyful an experience as possible? And that's what we try to get to. I think also to to kind of play on your really joyful experience with the insurance company, uh, people uh, are, don't actually read a lot of what they're looking at on a website. We've gone through, you know, what, 20 years, 30 years now of looking mm. at websites. They've come a long way, even just in the last couple of years. People are looking for the colors, the, the primary and the secondary button. They're looking for you know, the labels, but they're not actually really reading them. They're just trying to find the things that they recognize and, mm. and move through that with almost like muscle memory. And that's, you know, the convention, UX convention is, you know, you put save and exit in a button that's more like a link or, you know, an outline mm. button rather than a filled button. And then you've got your primary action as the bright, big, colorful button that you want people to go to. And I think, you know, th things like that are such a simple thing that you can look at and and mm. see like, oh, you know, if you're quickly moving through this and you're just trying to get through this insurance thing, because it's not it's not an easy thing to do. Nobody really enjoys doing that. You know, it's adulting. You know, you don't really want to go <laughs> and mm. deal with insurance things if you don't have to. So a lot of people aren't coming on, you know, to have a good time. But as Rob said, you want it to be simple and effective and you want to get through that form as quickly as possible and have that recognition without needing to read the button every time. Yeah, there's a sort of mutually agreed language, isn't there, basically, that that we've we've kind of come through just, I suppose, from people making decisions over time from the birth of the internet, we've ended up with the button that takes you forward or be on the right-hand side. And that probably comes from the direction that people reading in the west i imagine but it's it's now it's now so embedded like you say in people's thought process and even muscle memory that if you break with that you've suddenly got a really confusing experience of people to use that's an excellent point sam i think the there's a there's a, a balance to be struck between the sort of homogenization of design so we do see a lot of you know it's pretty easy to, to put together a nice looking website now there's a whole host of great sort of templating sites out there and you know lots of online courses that you can take and you know the standardizations become become pretty solid so there's there's a balance to be had between you know we, we as designers sometimes get a little bit self-indulgent and we want to reinvent the wheel at times and you know do things in more creative and expressive ways but I think you know to a degree it's about knowing where to sort of choose your battle so you don't want to put something that's really important such as a you know a, a burger menu button or, or a search menu or a, a close button or a join button or whatever it might be there's a couple of really key things I need to know what that's generally going to look like and where that's generally going to be otherwise it's going to again create confusion either make me do the wrong thing either I get into that loop of save and exit or you know maybe I, I commit to something accidentally or maybe it just slows me down and frustrates me and again I'm going to have less of an affinity for the organization so that's either going to damage the brand's reputation or again I might move away to a competitor yeah. but it is about making sure we do maintain that level of creativity and making sure we're creating you know unique and brilliant and exciting experiences and I think that's where you know brand has has a good part to play um you know making sure that we're capturing the sort of character and, and spirit of the organizations that we're designing for whether it's playful animations <laughs> whether it's you know the way that we're styling components, bringing in iconography and illustration, you're trying to bring in a bit more of that warmth and personality around those brilliant basics of close button is here, save button is here. And research is such a key part to that as well when it comes to usability. You know, there's all these things that exist like you were saying they're things that are set almost set in stone not really but like rules that people follow that are just kind of general knowledge for people that are using websites and I think that research is something that's skipped over a lot because a lot of organizations think well I know about my users I, I know who they are like I could name off Deborah and Barbara and John, and they've all said, you know, this about the website and they think it's great. But something that I live by, a phrase that I live by is nothing about us without us. And that 
means making sure that you're asking everybody, including everybody in your research to understand what you're designing for and who you're designing for. It's really key to get their voices in to understand, you know, maybe you've got a website already and you need to understand what they're coming onto your website for. Are they looking for a membership? Are they looking for information? Are they looking to come volunteer? You know, all of these journeys have a, a different set of steps that people have an idea in their mind, but they don't necessarily think, in, you know, that they have an impact or, you know, anything like that because they're not usually given a voice. And that's where research comes in and going and speaking to people and understanding what their goals are coming into your organization, coming onto your website. It, it's so important to to have that. And that's important for the design of your site, the usability of your site, your brand, things that people will connect to. It, all of this plays a huge part in how you present yourself as an organization on the internet. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier, Katie, about like different tech sizes on websites, but like what are the other sort of principles of accessibility? So the main principles are making sure that you're supporting things like media, so alt text, not hiding text within images, text size, which is the contrast of the colors, the size of them, not using all caps where possible, which is, it feels like one that doesn't it's not as obvious to people why don't we do all caps but um, kind of along the same lines as you know people recognize the buttons by the color we recognize words by the shape and you know people with things like dyslexia or a learning disability will probably struggle to read and they will pause and it will take them a really long time to read through sentences or, or long titles that are in all caps uh, because it's just one big block it, it's all straight and it looks like a big rectangle to them and even to you know neurotypical people it's harder to read through things that are in all caps because we recognize a word based on the shape of the word instead of actually reading the word and that's how we can read through things more quickly um, other things like navigation using proper use of links and link text, making sure that things are underlined or a different color when they're in a big block of text to show that they're interactive, you can click on them. Um, awareness of repeat links. So people who use screen readers will go through the site and it will read it out to them. And if you've got a bunch of buttons that say learn more, all they're gonna hear is learn more, learn more, learn more, learn more. And that'll come back into their ear and they're like, learn more about what? I don't know what that means. So making sure that those are labeled properly, um, as I said before, color contrast, making sure that there's enough contrast between important elements like text um, and, and interactive elements uh, to the background, uh, making sure that your website's free of distractions. So even neurotypical people will struggle to read a website if they've got something that's going like this over in the corner because they're constantly fighting to find what the thing is that they're supposed to be focusing on because there's something that's just busy and in their sight and oh my god I can't focus because it's too distracting um, and then having a, a greater awareness of assistive technologies so screen readers being the obvious ones um, alternative keyboards, toggle switches, stuff like that. Um, I had a student once who had no mobility in his hands. And so in order to use his tablet, he had a little toggle switch that was by his head. And so he would flick through things by tapping it with his head and it would switch to the next thing and it would read it out and switch to the next thing and it would read it out. And I think that that is a, a really key thing to think about when you're doing your site is making sure that it's supporting or it's supported by you know mm. the assistive technologies that people use um and also like thinking about plugins for accessibility they're great in theory but they don't always do what you want them to do i've seen a lot where it will make the text bigger so that people can see people with vision impairment but then it'll break the site and you can't actually read it because now it's overlapping with text and it's overlapping with images and you can only really see one word at a time like this, but it's over other things. And 
you know, it, it like I said, they're great in theory, but if you design accessibly from the get go, it should well not one not break your sight and two be easy for everyone to see and and understand um so those are kind of some key things that you need to look out for when you're designing your site mm -hmm. and think about yeah i think that as a as, as a team and as an agency we've we've really been you know taking a, a sharp focus on accessibility for a good number of years now we've invested in <laughs> training um across a lot of our designers and our developers and and really from a you know, from a design perspective you know it's all about working within rules, within working within guidelines. We work to a brief, we work to brand guidelines, we work to the vision that a client may have, whatever it might be. It's all about designing within confines. Sometimes the the scariest thing you can give a designer is a completely open brief. Sometimes people just completely go to pieces at that. And I've seen that when I was um, studying at university all that time ago. And really, you know, working to the accessibility guidelines are really just another set of rules to to follow. So as as Katie mentioned, if we're taking those on board if we're embodying them from day one of the project it doesn't really hamper your creativity at all we do firmly believe that you know accessible design is good design you know just setting your minimum tech size to a slightly larger size isn't going to affect the impact of your design yeah. making sure that the color contrast is sufficient again that's not going to actually harm your design at all if anything it's going to make it better so just by embracing those rules making sure that you're you know, taking them um, as part of your practice for each, each and every project. Um, you know, we, we've we've seen really great results from that as well. Everyone's really got behind it, and um, I think that it's raised the level of our project significantly. I think it's yeah. a huge myth too that people think that if you're designing something accessibly, that you're going to end up with a really ugly site, and that's just not the case. And on top of you know, get, I feel like for me when I'm designing something when I have confines, it makes me more creative than a blank page with the world to look at. Mm -hmm. And I think like being able to say, oh, I've designed this in a way that everyone can use it. Somebody can come on here, they are deaf and they need to watch this video. It's got closed captions or it's got transcripts. Like knowing that that is supporting your users should give you it should make you proud, really, that you have a really beautiful site and it's something that people can use, which is it's a no brainer. That's a winner. I think something that I didn't know about accessibility until recently as well um, is that obviously there's like the legal side of it as well, isn't there? There's the mm -hmm. um, web content accessibility guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, what can you talk us about what that means and how you meet that? Yeah, they so put together a list of criteria that is something that you need to meet in order for your users to be able to use your website. So it's a global organization that have come together to make sure that everybody's needs are met and represented. And they update these and they make sure that they're, you know, current and they do a lot of research and they put it in so that we don't have to, but this is, just a box to tick really so as i was saying before about alt text you will pass wcag with a really terrible alt text the queen underscore underscore crown underscore two five eight nine you know that that counts and that's ticked a box but it should give you the awareness to think okay well i've ticked that box but maybe i should make it better maybe i should make it you know something that's usable for people who aren't able to see this photo and are using a screen reader. Um, so there's a website that you can go to and you go through all of the criteria and, and double check it to what's uh, single A, double A and triple A standards. And single A means you've passed, it's all right, it, it, you know, it works. Double A is usually what people will try to aim for because that's, I feel like that should be the minimum viable product <laughs> is making sure that it's at double A. Triple A has, you know, quite a few important things on there. They're not always achievable for every organization. So things like making sure that you have transcripts or additional languages or, you know, kind of stuff like that in your videos not everybody's going to have the resource to be able to do that or the time. Um, but it is important to make sure that you're you're double checking your site to those 
and then also being aware of additional things that your users may have said about something that they can't access. Yeah, so mm. for a lot of organisations, it is a legal requirement. So if you're working in the public sector, if it's government, council, charity, meeting those double A um, requirements is something that we legally have to meet. But again, there's no real reason why we shouldn't be aiming for those with each and every project. Um, mm. And as you as you say, Katie, the I always think that accessibility should be seen as a as a conversation, as ra rather than a box to tick. As you mentioned around the the alt text point there, so you can you know tick that box technically and that is that is sort of done but it's there's always more that you can do the you know the the uh the guidelines are constantly being reviewed um new versions are coming out it's an ongoing piece of research sometimes there's even conflicting opinions over the the interpretation over some of those guidelines particularly around how sort of animation and video can be used across across platforms and i don't think there's ever going to be a, a time where we can completely cover off any and all instances for all use cases it's just you know a bit of a pipe dream but as long as organizations and brands are taking that conscious effort to move towards you know improving things you know opening up feedback channels with their audiences so if something you know isn't isn't quite right for them allowing people to get in touch and you know flagging up any mm. issues that, that you might encounter and i think as long as we're you know moving towards the same goal i think that's all you can really ask of people yeah, it brings it back to that idea of um, of, of user focused design, doesn't it? So there's there's a difference between um, just meeting the guideline on say having uh, alt text with images, but the real um, the real benefit comes from actually understanding that well that's the text that will literally be read out to somebody. I don't know if everybody has that understanding necessarily. I didn't always know that. Mm -hmm. um, another good example is. Um, can you tab through your website? Uh, that's a box to tick, but does everybody have the understanding that actually being able to tab through a website means that you can tap a button with your knee if it's just a single button input device that you can use that um, input you mentioned where somebody was tabbing to the next thing with a head movement. Um, I don't think the link is necessarily always there between the technical guideline you have to tick and what the end human interaction is with that point and i think once people have that understanding there's so much more that you can do with it it stops being an exercise in box ticking you think oh yeah that means actually it can interface with this device or um i understand now that the label on that image is literally going to be read out to somebody so if it's a string of letters and numbers and hyphens that could that could be 30 seconds of somebody's time wasted while it reads out the title of an image. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that knowledge is always there necessarily. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fundamentally, you're making these changes to get a green tick, or you're making these changes mm -hmm. to help people. One of the things yeah. that uh, I've learned in my career when working with special education, more so working with the public around special education, because I, I worked in a a continuation school for adults with disabilities who weren't able to work um, and weren't able to really kind of function on their own, but they were still high functioning enough that I could bring them out to go get a coffee. So we'd go to Starbucks or, you know, anything like that. The lack of awareness that the general public have around disability, it, it's like a, a blindness, a blind spot for most people. And I feel like I'm quite privileged. I grew up around someone with very severe autism um, and I have had this awareness my entire life so to come in and, and see people that don't know about it they don't know that there are hidden disabilities they don't know that somebody with ADHD may have auditory processing disorder so they can't watch a video and retain any information because they're just listening to it whereas you know if you've got captions that helps them and now they're seeing the words and the action and they can put those two things together in their brain and i think as you said it it's important to know who the audience is that you're you know designing for um even the people that you may not know that you are designing for because you know how just doing the action will take the box but it won't yeah. actually help and, and having that knowledge is so important um because i feel like a lot of people just don't know 
<laughs> they, yeah. they don't know about it. They're not educated on it. And WCAG gives a little bit of insight into that. Um, mm. But I think it's important for us as an organization for designing websites, but also for the organizations that we're designing for to actually do their research and really think about disability and, and take it seriously because the, it's a lot of people that will not be able to use your site if you're not putting them in the forefront of your mind. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think like it's also just why it's so important that we have these conversations because I think it is that lack of awareness. I feel like I didn't know much about it until more recently. Um, and yeah, I imagine there's a lot of people out there that are just kind of like, don't really know. Yeah, don't really know much about it at all. So I worked with somebody else who was a an accessibility uh, specialist as mm -hmm. well. And I learned a lot from him. But whenever we would go in to research things, uh, because I, I worked with uh, charity organizations, nonprofits, a lot of times I would be pulled into the ones that were for special education charities and I or disability charities. And I would come in and I would have all of these things that I'd rattle off of my, my past experience. And we'd come off the call and my colleague would say, I had no idea about that. I didn't even think that this one flashing image could cause somebody to have a seizure. I didn't think about that, you know, and, and it, it is something that you can learn every day and putting in that effort will really create a connection to this audience that often feels put to the side, you know, that mm. there's not a lot of education around it. Like I said, people don't really know about it. So if somebody comes in and they they don't feel like they're represented or understood, they don't want to stay there because they're already having to go through that in their entire life just going to get a coffee just walking down the street trying to do their job it it's really frustrating if you come on and you're not represented Rob, you, you've got some slides to show us with some some real world examples and then that'll kind of move us into to some things that maybe people can have a look at on their own sites to uh, uh to see where they might be falling down absolutely you know as a designer i'm a visual person so why not bring things to life with a couple of uh visual examples so um hope you can see this one okay so a couple of um picture the scenes for you so picture the scene number one you're commuting on public transport you're you're looking to put on one of your favorite cat videos on the way home from work you're really excited to do this but you realize that your airpods have run out of juice so what do you do in this situation do you not watch the video obviously that's not an option for you do you play the video out loud and you know, invoke the wrath of your fellow commuters? Or do you simply turn on sort of closed captioning and watch it with some subtitles as well so you can better understand what's going on? So in this situation, you can see how including subtitles are great for not only those who are hard of hearing, but also great for people in certain situations when having the audio of that video um, simply isn't an option. Did you know that 18% of the population use closed captions, even if they don't have a hearing impairment? Yes. Yeah, 80% well. of those people, of the 18% that watch with closed captions, don't have a hearing disability. They're not hard of hearing or deaf, and they use closed captions. I use closed captions. Yeah, I do as well. It helps people to focus a lot. I think if you're, if you're watching a... Uh, if you're watching a, a, a film, maybe with a couple of friends at home and people aren't paying sort of full attention or there's a bit of background chatter going on, helps to draw the focus in. And, you know, I think everyone falls foul of multi-screening as well. You know, you, you're mm. sort of watching TV, but you're sort of on your phone and you've sort of got your laptop there as well. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. your, your partner's kind of fourth or fifth down in that pecking order of focus. So you're not putting <laughs> all of your attention into that screen. So if you do have the you know, the words on there, as well as the audio, as well as the action, mm -hmm. helps draw in more senses and makes it more of a, a sensory sort of focused experience. It aids in uh, comprehension and information absorption as well. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, because you, you kind of, you end, you end up sort of reading along with the audio, don't you, which sort of backs mm -hmm. it up or following along a little bit ahead, which is why I, I can't use them for drama because I end up just reading <laughs> um but yeah. if it's something educational then yeah I find it helps with that to have the to have the words on screen and be able to kind of follow along it does seem to get it into your head a bit better mm -hmm. so I, th I think that's a really good example I think it's something that we you know we tend to come across 
if not on a daily basis, certainly sort of every every week or so, each, each and every one of us may be in that situation. Um, situation number two, now although these days feel like they're they're long gone of sitting on a lovely sunny sun lounge in the middle of a park, you know, it looks quite nice and sunny where I am here in Marple, but um, you know, the dark nights are drawing in. So situation number two, you're lapping up the last of the summer sun and you're, you know, enjoying reading an article, but you're struggling to actually see what's on your screen because the you know the sun is actually glaring onto your onto your smartphone so in this situation it'd be really beneficial if there was a you know really strong color contrast between the text that you're trying to read and the background that is sat on as well so again this is a good situational example of where high color contrast makes sure that everyone can read and understand content um quickly and easily but of course, having those sort of higher levels of color contrast is also particularly useful for those with um, with visual impairments. So if they have different degrees of color blindness, for example. Yeah, where they won't be able to see a color. We actually have somebody on our team who's colorblind. So we <laughs> go to him quite a lot for those colors and say, can you see this? <laughs> but there's also a lot of tools that will simulate this for somebody who doesn't have color blindness. And you can see and make sure that the color combination that you've made will not affect somebody with partial or complete color blindness. Mm. Yeah, there, there was a real world example of this a little while back. I think it was, um, I think, I think you must have told me about this one, Rob, uh, in a previous, um, a previous <laughs> session we've done, but it was when uh, Prince Philip died and a train website changed their yes. oh. visuals to um, morning colours, you know, yeah. all blacks and greys. Yeah. yeah, and they had to then roll that back within a few hours because the new colour palette actually made yeah. it that if you were, if you had certain visual impairments, you just couldn't use the website anymore because it was all black on grey and um, it was really hard to see under certain conditions. I found yeah, it to be very cool. funny, but also very, like, it is yeah. very serious in, mm. in the ways that people <laughs> don't think about that. No, especially for a website like trains, like something that, you know, people, people use, all, use the all the time. It's just like, yeah, the fact that people don't think about it, it baffles me. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, it's kind of handy when those big high profile examples come come to light because it does really shine a sort of national or sort of global light on those sort of situations. And it hopefully makes you know, the wider population actually appreciate why these things are in place. So if everything becomes really saturated, you can't read text, you can't read buttons, you know, yeah. sort of sucks all the usability out of a platform. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got just one more for you. So yeah, the situation here is that being a multitasking millennial parent is pretty hard work when you're balancing your baby in one arm and trying to sort your life out with the other maybe you're trying to book that long overdue date night um you know you don't always necessarily have the time the space you know the quietness both hands available to navigate around a website to go on to a you know search for a restaurant go onto that website check out the menu go to the sort of booking form say how many people is in your party, say what date it's going to be and actually sort of convert through. There's quite a few steps there for, for what is what is quite a, a simple sort of daily task. So, you know, it's all well and good if you've got all the time in the world, sat at your laptop in, in your office or at home, wherever it might be. If you're multitasking, if you're not really got full focus on that task because you've got lots of other important things going on, if you've only got one hand to use your phone, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier about making sure that the fundamental usability of, of, of your website is at a high standard, making sure that there is, for example, sufficient um, touch space around a call to action button. So making sure that the book and cancel button aren't, you know, 10 pixels apart from each other because I might have accidentally hit the wrong button because I don't have full time to focus on that making sure that information is organized in a clear and logical manner, making sure that the, you know, the, the main menu button is in, um, is in a sort of traditional space as well. So making sure that we're following those design fundamentals, making sure that there's sufficient tuck space, making sure that we're, you know, got text at a reasonable size with, with reasonable color contrast as well. All of these things come together to make sure that you've got a really you know accessible and usable platform. So, you know, the example there around tuck space, that's obviously really useful for someone who's you know, juggling a baby, multitasking and on the go. But it's also, you know, particularly important for someone who maybe has um, poor motor skills. Maybe if you've got, um, 
you know, your 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 hands are a little bit shaky or if you you can't be quite as precise as you might have liked with your touch space so all of these things are beneficial for people with particular impairments but hopefully you can see from that example how it's actually benefiting everyone and there's no kind of trade-off there in terms of usability experience look and feel it's just always a good idea uh some of the easy ones are ones that i've mentioned before making sure the size and color of your text are you know to the right degree so making sure that things on your website don't go below 16 um, pixels um, and if they do make sure that they're bold so 14 is usually the lowest that i'll go on a desktop um, but it has to be bold and that's what meets the wcag criteria uh, things like uh, making sure that there's alt text on images. That's not exactly an easy one to check for everyone, but it is something that's very important that you're checking. Um, things like uh, color, as I said before, is really important, making sure that you're checking to be sure that it's high enough contrast. Don't put white on that yellow, for example, because you won't be able to see it. Um, there's, there's lots of free tools as well. I, I pulled up one, one such example here, which is uh, colorcontrast.cc. There's lots of other great tools available. We use something called Stark, which is a brilliant sort of industry standard platform. Um, but this is just a real simple website where you can throw in two colors. So put in your main brand color, put in white or put in black or whatever the sort of contrasting color is going to be and see what your, what your score is going to come across at. And I think... As a general rule, Katie, would you say to look for that sort of double A normal pass as, as your as your real benchmark here? Yeah, it's a good benchmark. I think a lot of people feel like they feel a bit overwhelmed by trying to meet AAA standards. They want to have the best, but double A is perfectly viable. It still works. Again, if you're putting white on yellow, that's not going to pass and it will flag up very, very clearly for you. Um but meeting double A is totally fine. Um, you don't have to feel bogged down by needing to make sure that you meet AAA for color contrast. Yeah, I think that sometimes this feeds its way into branding as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, it might be a simple switch of you need to use black text instead of white text, for instance, but sometimes it might be that your brand just isn't well equipped for digital. So you know, we, we offer a lot of branding services as an organization. Sometimes it's wholesale rebranding exercises. Um, sometimes we're helping sort of startups to actually shape and define their brand identity from the ground up. But more often than not, we're working with organizations to help move their brand forward um, into the digital age. I mean, it's, it's really surprising how many sort of um sort of brand color palettes just aren't really suitable for web you know they don't really don't really pop on screen they sort of consistently fail to meet those accessibility guidelines so sometimes it can only be a little bit of a nug so maybe making your primary green a little bit darker or you know just adjusting a couple of hues so mm -hmm. it's just making sure that it's not drastically changing the aesthetic of the brand and the general look and feel but it's actually making huge leaps forward in terms of the usability in terms of how it's presented on screen as well one of my freelance clients when I first started working in UX had sent over a color palette for this startup product that she was trying to make. And it looked like something that you would paint your house with and not necessarily design your website with. It was a bunch of really pale yellows, maybe a slight, you know, muted brown color. It was very much like, maybe we shouldn't go with these, but I will take that away and, and try and fit to that to make sure that your product will work for what you're trying to do but not only are they not accessible they really don't translate very well okay so um shall we have a look at the usport trust site and uh, see some of these principles of accessibility in action yeah absolutely cool. okay so this is a project that we're particularly proud of of course you know each and every project that we work on we're, we're really invested in but this one was um was a little bit special because it was really I mean, working with an organization that we really believed in working with a charity organization in new sport trusts and it was an excellent opportunity for us we not only had the chance to 
redesign and rebuild their website from the ground up. But the organization had also recently been through a rebrand with a sort of third party supplier. So we had the excellent challenge of actually taking this new brand identity and being really the first people to road test it. And, you know, as as, as anyone will, will attest, your your website is really the focal point of any brand. You know, if you haven't heard of an organization before, the first thing that you'll do is Google them. And the first thing that should come up is their is their website and in particular their homepage as well. So as we talked about a little bit earlier on the pod, um, although accessibility is, you know, always a good idea for organizations for certain um companies and certain sectors it's actually also a legal requirement to meet um those standards so for you support trust being in the charity sector we had to meet the wakag uh 2.1 double a standards um at a minimum um and this was great because it meant that we could take on their new brand we had to make sure that their their colors repaired um in, in an appropriate manner the brand guidelines themselves actually instructed us to only pair certain colors um, with each other. So we had sort of combinations of, sort of two to three different colors. So we had to make sure that A, they worked in terms of being um, compliant web accessibility um, and also sort of constructing itself together in a sort of cohesive and sort of, you know, um, aesthetically pleasing manner um, across the website. So a couple of things that we looked at here, um, you know, we've got reasonable um, reasonably sized um, text, so making sure that we've got really nice bold headings, making sure that any, any body copy um, is at least sort of 16 pixels. We wanted to really make sure that we had lots of energy in the website's design. So, of course, it's all about, you know, getting children and young people active whilst sort of meeting the accessibility guidelines. We didn't want to lead in with too much video because that can be very you're distracting, disorientating, you would at least have to have a very clear pause button um, on that. So we wanted to give the whole website a feel that it was you know, constantly moving, very energetic. So we've got these angular devices, uh, such as the sort of blue block over the hero here. We had the stylized Y from the YST logo sort of bursting out um, of the hero image. And you've got this really sort of positive and energetic photography as well, really coming together here. So um yeah you know, making sure that we've got that great contrast between the blue and the white of the text making sure that we're when we do lay text over an image making sure it's behind a solid color block making sure we're not putting text directly onto images that's another um sort of quick win and easy fail for people and not um, putting it in the actual image itself as well i find a lot of organizations will put a picture that has you know text on it that they've put you know in and paint you know ms paint <laughs> just like <laughs> slapped it on there and you know that's not readable for people with um with screen readers because it doesn't show up for them Absolutely. So. so making sure all of our text is actually you know can tell there can actually highlight it it's real it's not just part of the picture <laughs> yeah. um giving nice little indicators as well so i've got my clear sort of navigation here i can go into the about section resources i can join up um go into news and insights but you know, simple things like adding the little carrot device next to it lets me know that there's actually more to, to learn there. It's not just a single button to be clicked. Um, as you can see, the, the colors change dramatically. We've got a clear underline. It's really, really clear to me um, which of these items I'm hovering over. You know, I'm clearly hovering over the about rather than the program section. And again, nice, clear interactions. This is where we can have animation and a bit of brand coming in to actually enhance the UX and make the platform more, more usable. So I can hover over these items and I've got that nice, simple transition, italicizing and embolding the text, changing the color, making it really, really clear that I'm hovering over that item and that that item is clickable as well. So using animation to indicate um, interaction. I think a lot of people forget how important micro interactions are for anybody on a, a website to see that there is something there for them. The simple underline being like the key one for links is when you hover over it, it should highlight a little bit. Your mouse will change. Loading screens are extremely important for people to indicate that, oh, I've clicked on something, but it's done nothing. Did I break it? Is it you know, working? if they've got just a little thing to say we're working on it it you know people relax 
Yeah, exactly. It's about having multiple points of difference to in indicate that interaction as well. So if it was just color alone, if I was just changing from blue to orange on hover, not everyone is necessarily going to be able to detect that. You know, yeah. there's, there's different ways of interpreting color. So, you know, we've got these really nice clear tiles. Um, and when I interact with those, it's it's a full wipe. So it goes from, from white to that solid color. Again, it's got that nice gentle sense of motion. So not only is it aiding the interaction and showing that it's clickable, it's actually feeding into the brand as well. It's making the whole platform feel energetic and a bit more dynamic and, you know, something you really want to get involved with without having to be in all singing or dancing, you know, constantly animating, constantly sort of flashing in your face. So it's striking that balance between, you know, serving that brand purpose, making that connection with people, pulling people in, um, as well as being accessible, as well as being, you know, highly sort of empathetic and inclusive as well. There was something that you mentioned there around not relying on color alone, which is another really easy win for organizations to check on their website is that they're not just relying on a color change to show that they're on the join us page. Like you said, there was that underline, it's gone bold, you can see the visual difference or the hover state on that thing where it completely wiped. You will see a change in a dark color to a light color, but you're not fully relying on the fact that somebody can see that it's blue. It is a very stark difference between the contrast of what was there and what is now there. So even if somebody can't see the color blue, they only see it as gray, they will see a change in that. And, and that's really key. Yeah, exactly. So even with these, with these tiles just below, so they're a little more discreet as tiles. You know, we, 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 we took an intentional design decision to not make them really sort of blocky and high contrast against the background because, you know, we're trying to get that sort of aesthetic blend as well you know really making sure that we're making those you know aesthetically pleasing platforms that are also really sort of highly usable but you know we draw the attention in through sort of clear headings and you've got those um call to action buttons which really sort of stand off the page as well so again when i interact with that card you've got a bit of dynamism you've got the arrow that sort of extends out when we hover over them then you've also got the text moving and you've got the text underlining as well so there's at least three indicators there that shows that that section um is clickable so again there's you, know, you don't always have to be sort of shouting about your message to get it across clearly and i think that you know particularly across something as as complex and as intricate as website design it is about getting that balance right um you know if we had a sort of full throttle design that was you know really high impact everywhere it kind of dilutes everything so sometimes you have to you know quiet it down a little bit and just use some different techniques to um to encourage usability. One thing that you had mentioned a little bit earlier on was tap targets and click targets. And I think that things like these blocks are really important because people will see the find out more thing and they think, oh, that's a button. But if somebody doesn't have the dexterity or the coordination or, you know, as you said, having shaky hands, they can click on the whole box and that whole thing is interactive. And I think that that's something that's really important for development to think about is not just relying on the button being the clickable target, is making the whole thing clickable, whether that's making the title also clickable to find out more and go to the same thing, or in this instance, it's the entire box. You can click anywhere in that box and it will take you to PE Life Skills Award. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I won't go through the whole um, the whole platform on, on, on the pod today, but I would encourage people to to visit it and see for themselves. And one of the things that I was most um, pleased with with the platform is just how well it performs. So it's not just about, you know, designing it in um, an inclusive manner. You know, it has been engineered really brilliantly. We made sure that the pages perform lightning fast. So once you jump into any section, you know, you know, drop down interactions behave straight away page loads are instantaneous you're making sure that you can actually enjoy the platform even if you've got quite a low sort of internet bandwidth um as you can see toward, towards the bottom here they've, they've recently included some some awards that the, that the platform's picked up so you know it's always nice to get that positive feedback and particularly on a, on a platform like this where we did really bake in those accessible principles from the very start um you know i think it's probably the best example that i can give that you know accessible design is good design it's easier to design accessible first as well than to go back and fix things after you've found out that they're not accessible. You know, you, you've designed this whole platform. It looks really great. You love it. Your client loves it. 
you know, whatever. And then you go through and you check against WCAG and you find out that half of it is not accessible. It doesn't pass. So it, it makes sense to, from the very beginning, make sure that everything that you're designing follows that criteria rather than having to go back and do it all over again. It's almost like, you know, writing an essay and then finding out that you've written it to the wrong prompt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it kind of goes back to that point of like accessible design can be really good, beautiful design because I think the results speak for themselves. The fact that it is an award-winning website, um, it's, yeah, it's great yeah and I, I say it was it was a great opportunity because we had the we had the the chance to work with a fresh new brand identity for the organization as well so the um you know the sort of the third party supplier there had made sure that all of their colors had really great contrast they'd explore different typefaces they'd actually refined the logo as well so it wasn't a, a radical shift from what YST used to have but it's basically turned into a a single color kind of black logo so you know looking at maximum um, you know, maximum sort of contrast and, and, and legibility there. Um, but I'm just going to segue over to a little bit about, about about brand, if that's okay, guys. Yeah, that sounds good. So we we talked about brand um, a couple of times already. I'm just going to show a couple of um, sort of real world examples. So this slide in particular makes me feel really old when you look back <laughs> at it. You know, it only dates back to sort of 1998, but you can see how slowly over time that you know world famous logo has has been refined and you know some of this is based on kind of design trends so you know at one point everything was you know jumping off the page we had lots of sort of heavy shadows we wanted everything to feel really sort of tactile as well you know to try and bridge that gap between sort of the real world um, and the screen um and you know, over the, over the course of what what is this sort of 12, 12 years or so here, the the logo itself has fundamentally sort of stayed the same. It's still just the word Google. It's still in a similar sort of serif typeface. We dropped the exclamation mark um, at the turn of the millennium. Maybe a bit, bit less immediacy there around around sort of Google. But you know, it's using the same kind of colours. Maybe the colour palette's shifted slightly, but you know, it's been that. That slow, slow evolution, um, you know, just to try and refresh a brand and sort of bring it forward. But I think, you know, their their most recent logo, um, and you know, the one that we're we're all more familiar with today, um, you know, it really embodies the sort of modernization and digitization of brands um an awful lot more. So as you can see, they've moved to a completely different typographic style here. They've actually invested in their own custom sans serif typeface. Um, you're removing all the sort of embellishes, there's absolutely no shadowing there at all. They've really made sure that that logo is as clear, as crisp, and as legible as possible. And this is a real key that we're seeing with brands that we work with at the moment. It's about making sure that your logo can be used, um, you know, can it be used as a social media avatar? Can it be used in a mobile menu header situation? And, you know, most of the time we're seeing that, that isn't really the case. So it might be that a small adjustment's needed. It might be something more, more wholesale is needed. Um, and I think the real sort of hallmark of Google's success is bringing it right down to that one distinct G shape. So, you know, this works as an app icon. You know, it works on the sort of Google Pixel. It works in a mobile header. Um, and, you know, it's it's instantly recognizable um, as as that brand. So they've actually encompassed all the different brand colors into that one symbol. And I think this is really representative of Google taking that shift to be a sort of design led sort of innovation company. So you know, they've always been, you know, a massively popular search engine. And that's what you'd seen in those previous instances. But moving forward, you know, they're a technology company, they're an innovation company, and they've really done an awful lot of that through design. So it's about over time simplifying your brand identity making sure that it can work for screen making sure that it can work um at those smaller devices as well um and you mentioned starbucks earlier katie so another um you know this podcast isn't sponsored by Pub starbucks by the way but we will uh, <laughs> accept we free, free bags of coffee if they want to come along um you can see how their brand identity has really shifted quite a lot over the years but you know the the sort of mermaid has always been a, a central part of it so obviously quite a radical shift from 71 to 87 there but over time, that mermaid has always been sort of the focal point of the brand. And as you can see, over time, elements have been stripped away. The typography has been made clearer. The 
you know, the green colors become a lot more vivid. So it really sort of, you know, leaps off the page, leaps off the cup as well. And they've really, really simplified that to only have that, you know, very sort of core, core sort of icons. So we're seeing lots of patterns of this. And there's a whole host of other examples that, that I could go into, but, you know, brands are looking to simplify their message. They're looking to simplify the way that they visually present themselves and they're making sure that they can present themselves in a, a really clear and cohesive way, um, you know, primarily across digital as well. Yeah, it has to be able to fit in a square these days, doesn't it? It's no, it's no, it. it's no good if you can't there. square it. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be able to scale so that you could put it on a business card, you can make it really huge and it's not going to pixelate and get yeah. really weird and funky and yeah. So that's that's ways in which a brand can, you know, visually make themselves more more accessible um, and a bit more inclusive. But you know, we're seeing a bit a big shift towards more you know accessible and inclusive brands in a lot of other ways. You know, people are striving to get sort of B Corp status. You know, people are are really conscious about their sort of corporate responsibility. You know, I mean, are we as an organisation sort of doing away with printing unless absolutely necessary? You know, the, mm. the death of the business card has been another sort of byproduct of that. Um, mm. you know, do we want to minimise travel as much as possible? You know, perhaps, you know, if we have a working with a client overseas, do we have to, you know, have that, you know, incredibly pollutive um, plane journey over there? Or could mm. we just actually do this through sort of through Zoom or Teams and things like that? So, the way in which organizations are conducting themselves from their very core, um, I think is changing. And we're seeing that across, you know, a whole host of organizations. We're even going through a rebrand exercise ourselves. You know, we're looking to um push that out kind of in, in, in the coming year, but we took that deep look into what our values are, you know, how we actually sort of conduct ourselves as an organization. And that's manifested itself right the way through to the sort of visual aspects as well. So making sure that we got a, you know a color palette that works fantastically well in terms of color contrast, making sure we've got very sort of clear, legible and ownable typography as well. So a lot of users and customers will see that end manifestation of, you know, we've got a more digitally accessible and inclusive brand visually, but it really comes back to how organizations are actually conducting themselves too. So there's a, there's a whole host of interesting things going on here that are weaving their ways. You know, it's where kind of accessibility and design is sort of overlapping into sort of business strategy and into purpose as well. And, um, yeah, it's a really exciting time. Excellent. Well, I think that sounds like a good time to uh, bring our discussion and episode to a close then. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Rob and Katie, for joining us today. Uh, people can find uh, the both of you on LinkedIn. Is that right? If they want to open any discussions around around what we've been talking about today. Absolutely. Right. My inbox is always open. Same here. Love talking about accessibility. So happy to to fill people in. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again and uh, thanks for Thank listening and uh, we will see you on the next one. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for having us. Thank you. Thank you.